All right, guys, let's try to do another Howler Mouse history lesson. Uh, I got a lot of new viewers, and, uh, you know, I've been goofing off a little bit on here. But one of the things I really like to do on here is to discuss comic book history. I'm not talking about, like, continuity. I'm talking about kind of, like, outside comics, things that led to the books, things that happened uh, between uh, creators or some of their influences they came from, uh, what was going on at the time that reflects in the comic, and what this does is that this really uh, enriches my reading uh, experience in comics when I know what's going on behind the scenes or where things came in. Uh, and today we're going to discuss uh, a, a novel that came out in uh, 1930. I believe it was by a guy named uh, Philip Wiley. It was called Gladiator. Now this was in the time of the pulps, okay? We were one year into the Depression. And uh, it, it's a science fiction story. And back then, I think the pulps you had were uh, uh, The Shadow, Doc Savage, The Spider. Um, maybe, I'm not sure, but you know, within that time, the radio started having like Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon and things like that on it. Um, I don't know if that was specifically in 1930. When this Gladiator book came out by Philip Wiley, it was, um, it, it, was, it was well received, but I mean, it did become like a blockbuster. You know, you, you've heard of... Um, You've heard of uh, the guys that I mentioned. You've heard of Doc Savage. You've heard of uh, The Shadow. And there's people that's heard of The Spider and stuff. But nobody's really heard of uh, Hugo... Um, I'm going blank count here. Nobody's really heard of um, Hugo Danny. I think that's his name. Of all, I can't remember a hero. Hugo Danner. Okay, that's his name. And Hugo Danner, uh, in a book called The Gladiator, actually stands out for people who are really... Uh, kind of into the, the historical part of the comics, like, you know, I, I swear in, but, but by no means do I hold a candle to these guys and stuff. But anybody that's read Superman and is really into Superman has heard of the Gladiator book. Gladiator, okay? Because Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster never admitted to it, but when Superman came out in 1938, eight years after this book came out, the book kind of took off, and they even made a movie of The Gladiator in 1939, uh, but they kind of switched it around and ended up being a comedy. I've never seen it, uh, nor have I actually seen the novel, but here's why I know about it. <clears throat> this book, uh, this book, I'm not really sure where I first heard about it, but it's one of those things you kind of heard about Gladiator. And there's also this novel that uh, Elliot S. S. Elliot S. Megan uh, wrote in the, I believe it was the 70s, if not the early 80s, that you just needed to get because it talked about the Green Lanterns and Krypton and stuff. And then from there, people start talking about the Gladiator, the way to go way, you know, way back and stuff. And the Gladiator was not a superhero. And I, I hate even referring to as the Gladiator, but it was just Gladiator. Hugo was not a hero. This was a sci-fi book that Philip Wiley put out that if you read it, it comes off kind of real simple, but two, three things stand out, and I kind of think it was his opinion on religion, and you'll, and you'll see why. Now, I am a huge, huge, I'm a Roy Thomas fan of his comics, okay? When that guy wrote a comic, um, you know, he was creative, um, he was the second coming of Stan Lee to some people when he took off to uh, DC in 8081 and, and got a hold of all those golden age characters they loved. You know, he, he really created this whole world. He, he more or less made Earth 2, uh, for you guys to remember that back farm. We're talking about All-Star Squadron in the 40s. He pulled together all these different companies, Fleetwood Quality, um, uh, in National Periodic, which was DC, and, and all these properties that DC had bought up over the years. And he made like a, a loose continuity with all of them. Roy Thomas used to go around... Uh, uh, as a kid and he would collect golden age comics and stuff he loved them so when he got a hold of all these characters in all-star squadron he was able to pull together all these stories he's got uh, all-star squadron issues where he gives uh, annotations and bibliographies about what events happened in all-star squadron or events that he was referencing what the golden age comics were and he tried to bring it all together now roy thomas was also a school teacher um and that's kind of cool because i think he was aware of gladiator because Roy Thomas was the one that was tapped to uh, take uh, Conan. He brought Conan to the comics uh, based on the Robert E. Howard books. He uh, did Tarzan after Joe Kubert had done, you know, to, did his spin on it. 
And Roy Thomas also brought Hugo Danny, or Danner, or uh, Gladiator, in more or less in magazine form through Marvel Preview um, number nine here. <clears throat> this was published in 1976. And what this is, this is the first half of the novel. Okay, I don't know if there's ever supposed to be a second part, but he just told half, okay? And I could go through this whole book, and I can tell you right now, you know, beautiful artwork in it. I want you to notice the uh, clothing that he has on. I want you to notice the stripe in his hair, because that's going to happen again, and some of you guys may already know where I'm going with this. And just to get to the origin of all this, get to this page, I want you to pay real strict attention to this. But basically, at, it was supposed to have been at the turn of the century, uh, around the 1900s, the scientists um, had a very conservative religious wife, and he was just sort of miserable and stuff, but he was wanting to bring out genetic potential and things, so he came up with this serum, and he experimented on a, a tadpole, and the tadpole was able to bust out of the container he was in. Then he experimented on a cat giving him the serum and the cat ended up just having like super strength and some dragon stuff killing it and he had to poison it and the wife flipped out because he poisoned his cat well after he poisoned the cat um, his wife is laying there pregnant down there at the bottom panel and unbeknownst to her he injects the serum into her and the baby is born and she soon figures out that what he's done because the baby is bending bars okay he's lifting furniture as he gets older and they can't keep him in the crib and then he grows up now i wanted you to pay strict attention to that because that story is reflected in the first appearance of superman there's the baby in the crib there's the baby lifting furniture um and there he is lifting the car and in the book that first great picture of Action Comics number one also happens in Gladiator. Now, i got to remember, he was never a superhero in that book. I don't think the term, court term was uh, used. All right, so um, real quickly, what happens is, is that as he goes to school and grows up and everything like that, he gets bullied and picked on, but his parents have talked to him, and they've stayed together, even though you know the mom hates the dad for doing this, and amongst other things, you know, science versus religion. Um, Apparently, it's sort of a one theme in this book. You know, he gets bullied on, and he doesn't fights back. He doesn't. They don't want him to hurt him. Does that sound familiar? Okay. And he finally falls in love without being out in the woods. Okay. Now that could be another theme there: um, technology versus uh, nature. Okay. Because he goes out in the woods and he's able to pull up trees and he can be himself and he he builds like this little wonderland and stuff. And that gets messed up. Okay. So basically this guy becomes isolated. He, uh, he grows up, he, he goes to college, and while he's going to college, he's working as a strong man or something at a circus and also a wrestler. And then he starts playing football. Okay? And when he's playing football, he actually kills somebody. The story moves on about he's trying to find his place in this world, and he takes off. Uh, one of the things that are touched on in some of these series here, uh, is the amount of testosterone that goes through his body and he's well endowed and this causes him problem that lust trying to fall in love with women he makes he hurts women by accident some fall so in love with him that you know he can't help himself he's just a hound you know and it's because of the chemicals in him and stuff i mean he's a genetic species this is actually the when i read this one of my interpretations was yeah i can see how this influenced superman but is this the way that captain america could have went you know I'm not going to go off on that so um he, he never really finds his place and he does certain things trying to find it after he stops playing football and quits college after actually killing that guy during a football game he um, takes off the French Foreign Legion becomes World War One, and just rips people apart there he grows older and it just gets worse uh, these powers are more or less a curse you know this you know his gifts are a curse and, you know and he ends up uh, joining like an archaeological expedition and I'll stop right there for a minute and we'll pick up if you're still hanging in, if you're still interested. Now, Roy Thomas came in and did All-Star Squadron. And on Earth 2, we had, you know, the Golden Age Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and, you know, a few other people. Crisis on Infinite Earths happened. We got one world. Everything's getting rebooted. Pretty much, 
a lot of the work that Roy Thomas had put in had just gotten, you know, for four or five years at that time, had just they just crapped on it. And he had to come up with replacements and for the All-Star Squadron. And that book ended up becoming the Young All-Stars. And I had pretty much close to the whole run, and, and I wanted to say right now that I, I think it's garbage. Um, I tried to read it. I tried to hold on to it. I'm a fan of the Golden Age stuff. I still have the All-Star Squadron. If you guys have followed any of my videos from way back, Infinity Incorporated, you know, I'm, I'm all about that stuff. And the only issues I kept were uh, 9, 10, and 11 because it features a character named Iron Monroe. What they did is Iron Monroe popped up. I want you to get a look at him if I can find a decent picture. Okay? Roy Thomas is also writing this for DC, and he's got the, pretty much the same clothes, and he's got that white uh, streak of hair. Um, and what, what he did is Iron Monroe was the uh, replacement for Superman. He came up with a character named the Flying Fox who became the replacement for Batman. He had Fury come up as the replacement for Wonder Woman. You know, it's a tough sell. But Iron Monroe was special because people in the know got where he was going with this. came from Gladiator. This is not Hugo. This is Hugo's son. That's the only thing he changed. Okay? So Roy Thomas um, snuck Gladiator in here by calling it um, Iron Monroe ends up discovering the journal of his father, who apparently, you know, he hasn't seen in a while. The journal of Hugo Danner. Which leads to the next issue, number 10, which retells the story of Hugo Danner. He does it again. And uh, we can get a better picture here of Iron Monroe there. You know, and we start getting very Superman-like. He starts getting, he's got a little bit of the S flip there. Uh, kind of some of the colors. And they pretty much retell the tale with, you know, within the comics code that I just went through. But this continues on. Gets, it kind of touches on, instead of when it comes to the sex that was in there, he says there's some things in the journal that you know, should not be detailed in the journal. Talks about him being in there, talks about him actually killing somebody, but you know, it's real sanitized and it, and it really gets into the women. Um, you know, there he is killing somebody in his football career by accident while he's working part time as a strong man and a boxer and stuff on the side or wrestler. Um, such a really good story. It goes on, here he is in World War I. Okay. He's bulletproof with the skin. He's taking out, you know, Nazis left and right. Uh, just killing people. Comes a killer in there. Starts losing himself in his soul. Okay. Now remember, this was not DC continuity. And I'm going to try to go on here. Um, you know, he's crying and bawling and stuff. And just to go what's going on, he joins, in the, he, he comes real isolated and joins the archaeological dig. And he goes out to this jungle and stuff and he finally has it and he goes up there and he demands God tell him what his purpose is and, you know how can he defy his world he's mad at God now and he asks him is, is this your will or are you like all mankind impotent and he gets smited he gets struck by lightning and that's where he's supposed to die so in this series Iron Monroe or Hugo is still alive and that is his son which is kind of cool now here, here we go. I'm going to be wrapping this up pretty quick. You stood in here. I hope you're interested. The one I would recommend, if you're really interested in this, is a, a, a mini series that came out in 2005. Now I geeked out when I read about this. Uh, I lost it. Okay, Howard Chaykin and a guy named Rush Heat. Russ Heat. I'm going to explain who that is in a minute. Uh, came out, and this is going through Wildstorm. It didn't matter to me that Wildstorm was owned by DC, I was like, these guys at Image are still, are finally paying some tribute to the guys that laid the road for them. This is a four issue retelling of uh, the series. And it's not comic code, authority, you know, there's no comic code holding it back and stuff. It, it's intense, and it's by Russ Heat. There's number one, there's his football years, remember that cover. Number three, where he is, in, he's uh, they changed him to where he's in Vietnam, I believe, in this one, and that's the ending there. Okay. Now, they there's been things that happened in Superman. I'm one of those people that I think it's ridiculous to say there's no Superman stories uh, left to tell. It's ridiculous. Okay. 
Now, back in 1986, after they uh, had the crisis, John Byrne was brought in to revamp Superman. So I am like 12 years old reading this, and the first thing I see is that when they introduced to Clark Kent, he's a big super, uh, he's a big uh, football star at the high school. Now, does that sound familiar? All right. Byrne had a thing about going back to the beginning of Superman. He went back to that Golden Age stuff to see what was there, uh, you know. And, that, and, and is that a nod to Gladiator? I, I don't know, but I, th I think it is. That's why it just came out of the blue like that, it came out of left field. Uh, there's a little bit of Gladiator there. There's a little bit of him uh, not wanting to hurt anybody. That's one of the reasons he wasn't with Lana and had to be careful with people, and it's kind of toned down here, okay? Uh, I feel a lot of the reboot uh, is touched by the depowering of Superman and making him a bit more like Gladiator. One of the reasons Gladiator was also considered a big influence on Superman is that they actually used the description of strong as an ant and able to leap as high as a, like a human-sized grasshopper. That's in Gladiator and that was also in um, maybe Superman number one or something. It was almost the exact quote. So when they do things like this and you're reading Superman it kind of makes it fun because you want to know who knows their stuff and who doesn't that's working on Superman. And the biggest thing is, is like, in 1989, they came out with this issue, this uh, Superman in Action Comics Annual, continuing the story, uh, number two here. And I kind of caught the irony of having Superman become a gladiator on World World. And I, I kind of saw some tones here of him going off into space and stuff and being isolated. When John Byrne left, Roger Stern and uh, Tom Gamble and uh, who else was on that? Jerry Ordway kind of took over and they had Superman go off into space, much like Gladiator, um, you know, kind of went off into the world trying to find his place. So did Superman and he ends up becoming a Gladiator. I always just kind of wondered, is that where that story came from? Um, you know, if you go back and read this, this is from 89 and stuff. Uh, so basically, that's just a little bit of history. I barely scraped the surface on that. Uh, um, I don't think I was as thorough as I could have been, but I'm not going to, I don't want to rob you the joy of getting that. Now, I said I was going to tell you who Russ Heath is. Russ Heath was probably, oh my God, I'm thinking maybe 79 years old when he was brought in to do this. However it happened, I don't know, but I was so happy that they got Russ Heath. Russ Heath is a legend. Okay, you had war comics in the 50s and 60s and stuff, and Russ Heath was the guy, Russ Heath was the guy that could have knocked Joe Kubert down as the number one artist on all those war books. Russ Heath had a pop artist in 1961-62, uh, Flanstein, I can't remember, but he took two panels of Russ Heath's art, Russ Heath's art, from uh, our Army at War, or one of those books like that, um, Valenstein. I don't know. Look up Russ Heath on Wikipedia, and it became a big pop art sensation. He used his war art to get in there, right? And it was just so good. Their, their storytelling techniques. I, I'm I'm the guy that yeah, I appreciate what I'm a you know George Perez guy. I'm a, a McNola guy and stuff. I like these guys that can do art and storytelling and stuff. But these older guys are really forgotten nowadays. And it's, it's worth your time to maybe go back and check out some of their stuff, do a Google image search for some of their stuff. And Russ, he Russ Heath was one of those guys, man. He really laid some foundation down. He did some amazing art, okay? Some other guys I just want to mention out here is if you're a Black Knight fan, you need to look up uh, Joe Manley, M-A-N-E-E-L-Y, in the 50s. That guy did some fantastic art, and he's forgotten about because it may have been suicide, it may have not have been, but he got killed by jumping. He, he ended up in front of a train you know, on the tracks. Look up Russ Manning, if you don't know who that is. Al Williamson, I've, talk, I've praised him before. Alex Raymond, Al Williamson and Alex Raymond go hand in hand. Uh, Everett Raymond, uh, Kinster. Everett, Everett Raymond Kinsler. Uh, he was king of the dry brush. If you're a Gene Colan fan, you need to check out his stuff. Sid Shores, excellent guy. Graham Ingalls. Um, George Evans, Alex Toth, and Lou Fine. Okay, there's just a few names out there and stuff. Check out some of their stuff too, and definitely check out Legends. Out of everything I get, I've seen this thing in dollar bins, I've seen it in quarter bins. Get four issues of Legends, man. It's a great read. All right, there's my commercial for uh, those comic book kept me, so 
you know, I hope you guys are watching and, you know, send me some stuff. All right. Enjoy, guys.